looked on online and read any of the descriptions about any cities? No, you were working no. on the assignment. OK, well, if you yes. have a chance, if you have a chance this weekend, once your assignment's finished, it's a good chance to improve your language by noticing the different ways that they uh, describe the nouns. OK, we learned a lot of different ways yesterday uh, with um, compound nouns, compound adjectives, pre prepositional phrases, adverb adjective, um, relative clauses, participle clauses. So one of the keys to improving yourself is to notice when people use the language that you have been taught. And so go ahead and try to see if it's there, OK? Anyway, let's look. Let's do a little bit of listening here. We're going to listen to an interview with an expert on homes around the world. OK, and he is going to talk about why these homes are designed the way they are. Do we have any architecture students in the class? Yep. Yes. Who is the architecture? Yes. Yep. Okay. Tamara, Hiba, and Tala, and Yasmin? OK, lots of architects here. So take a look at this house that's on your screen. Why did they design it the way they did? Because the environment is, is good for the last thing. The question? What is the question again? The question is, why did these people design this house the way that they did? Uh, can I answer, Mr. Michael? Because mm -hmm. you have to yes. adapt to the yes, It rains a lot and the floods happen a lot, so they need oh. to have a strong structural system and they need to lift the house up from the ground so the water, when it comes, doesn't crash the house. Okay, good. So I don't think a it's a strong structural system. <laughs> okay, there, no. there's, someone, there's someone muted. Sorry, Hamza? There's someone. Uh, who keeps muting my mic? Oh, I don't know if we can actually mute your mic. You might be muting it yourself somehow. No, no, you uh, can mute everyone's mics. You can? All right, stop muting yeah. each other. So well, there are some floods here, right? So maybe if the flood comes, the being raised will yeah. help prevent some damage. Okay, anything yeah, else that you notice? That the roof and the in the angle of the roof because it uh -huh. rains. So Good. the rain will go into the house. So it okay. like go with the slope of the ceiling. OK, of the roof, yeah. And the, I think the, the materials are made from the, the surrounding trees. <laughs> OK, good. So they're using what they have available to make their house. I um, think what about hot, uh, it's hot Good. There, so that's why they don't have a wind like closed walls. Good, Rod. So since it's all open, the breeze can go through. Do you guys remember yesterday we learned that word breeze? Yeah, breeze. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anything else? Let's move on to this one then. Why is this one designed? Because igloos can actually trap the heat inside. Good. Yeah. So I can see heat. Mm-hmm. Good, so it traps the heat inside. Anything mm -hmm. about this shape? Does that matter? Maybe not to you know, stay in the way of wind. OK, so maybe the wind can can uh, flow off of it easily. Good. Anything else? Uh, it's actually designed to be like uh, maybe half half meter below the ground from the oh. entrance. From the entrance, so, so they they the dug hot under here. Stays inside, yeah. Okay, interesting. When I was uh, in the army, one of my assignments, I was a Russian translator, and a big group of um, soldiers from Kyrgyzstan came to Alaska to um, do cold weather training, and we had to build a smaller version of one of these. And it's amazing how warm you stay inside. If you have a single candle inside of the structure, it will warm up the whole place so that it's yeah. uh, easy to um, easy to sleep and you don't feel too cold. But how do they build it? 
So first we did like, uh, yep. First we did uh, like what um, I think Rod was saying, Rod or Ali saying you build it underneath. So you dig a little bit and then you, uh, yeah, you put um, blocks, see these blocks right here and you put them all around and a little by little uh, smaller and smaller until you get a roof here. And then the most important thing though is the door. You have to make sure you cover the door. We just used a big uh, boulder of snow to cover it so that no heat escapes. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. Good. So let's listen to this expert talk about uh, why these things were designed the way they were and uh, see if you guys had the same ideas. Unit three, recording two. Where did this interest in homes come from? You obviously had your own, but then what? Well, I trained as an architect and as a young man, I traveled an awful lot and my two interests eventually connected. But I had a real awakening when I traveled in Africa and, and parts of Asia. In Indonesia, I saw these enormous tree houses built high in the sky, made with the wood from banyan trees, and it just took my breath away. Hmm. These houses, 50 feet in the air. Why did they build them so high? Well, it's a refuge from wild animals and mosquitoes. And also in their culture, they believe in evil spirits and these spirits are earthbound. Oh. So it's really for protection. You're safe if you're higher up. Hmm. And you've also written about houses on stilts in your book. Yes. All along the Amazon rainforest, you can find fishermen living in these houses built on wooden stilts. Mm. I was fortunate enough to stay in a fishing community there for a month and see firsthand how it works, and it's pretty interesting. And on the other side of the world, igloos too. I stayed in an igloo in Greenland for three weeks. And you survived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, actually, they're far more comfortable than they look. They're pretty cosy inside. <laughs> The packed ice and snow acts as an insulator. So if we take the average sort of westernised home, mm. maybe bricks and cement, a bit mm -hmm. of wood, how do they compare to so-called primitive dwellings without toilets and running water, mm. uh, that kind of thing? Is there any comparison? Well, we have to understand what we mean by primitive housing. The original home was a cave, and when we talk about a caveman, we think of someone extremely primitive with no culture. Mm. But the funny thing is that caves are pretty good places to live. They're cool in the summer and warm in the winter. They give superb protection in that they'll never blow down in the wind. And in fact, they're well made for decoration. In what sense? Well, the so-called primitive caveman made paintings on the walls which survived thousands of years. And, you know, uh, any place you find caves, whether it's France, Spain, the United States, mm. uh, China, people have lived in them and decorated them and adorned them with figurines and artwork. But we have to recognise that these houses are built in accordance with the habitat and the surroundings. Mm. Um, you know, igloos keep out the cold and snow, and tree houses provide safety. Then there are yurts, which are portable houses made of a wooden frame and animal skins. You can carry them around with you. Well, a yurt is built so that the nomads in Central Asia can move as the season and the weather changes. So, you see, houses can be beautiful, but in most cultures, they're built to be purely functional above all. Okay, who can summarize the uh, speaker's words in just two sentences? Uh, can I speak? Sure. Uh, so uh, he talked about some of the places he went to and how they built the houses. Uh, and the, the reason why they built them like that um, and compare them and compare them to the houses we built in modern cities. Excellent. Perfect. Very good summary. So now let's go into the details. Who remembers what he mentioned about spirits? Uh, that they lie uh, beneath uh, or, or close to, to earth or mm -hmm. ground. So they build their houses uh, in the, up trees to avoid them. Good, to avoid them, good. Someone tell me what they talked about wooden stilts. 
They're made of wooden stilts, I think. Mm -hmm. Good, Yasmin. And so stilts are um, these here. This is called a stilt that keeps you like a beam, but from uh, wood. Uh, usually it's from wood. Yeah, a stilt. It's like a beam, beam off the ground to make you higher. Who, who else can tell me what uh, they were talking about as an insulator? Can I speak? No, uh, let's let someone else. Uh, Mr. Michael, can I? Sure, go ahead, Rod. Uh, asked as insulators, he was talking about uh, igloos and how they insulate uh, the, uh, the inner atmosphere from the outer one. Good, so it keeps the heat inside. Excellent. What did they mean by so-called primitive dwellings? Uh, can, I, can I answer? Okay, sorry. Who is that? Uh, uh, go Ali. Oh, okay. I think primitive Good dwellings way. is like uh, crude or uh, uncivilized. Mm -hmm. Can we say in a, in a sense? Good. What do you think they meant like by so, so called lathe? What do you think this extra part so added called, on? Um, so when someone when someone's trying to pin something on you, you would say it's a so called thing or like, wow, mm -hmm. I can't explain it. In further yeah, it's like it's basically like. Um, it's like he's people, not agreeing with it. It's like yeah, uh, that's right, Ali. So people call it primitive, but maybe he doesn't actually call it that. So it's so called because other people call it that. Excellent. How about adorned with figurines? What do they adorn with figurines? It's a way of decorating. Good. Okay. Adorn. Okay. Adorn. Okay. Good. Adorn okay. means decorate. And figurines are the small uh, statues. And anybody catch what they talked about nomads in Central Asia? Someone else that hasn't talked. It's a little harder. Nomads. A nomad is a person who travels from place to place. They don't live in one place very long. Yeah, yeah, about that, uh, a Yerks. Yurts, right. Does anybody know what a yurt is? Portable house, like a uh, uh, beach area. Yep, here's some examples of yurts. Some. Um, are they like um, Nawar? Like what, Hamza? No, no, no they are oh, whole, 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 whole nomads. Uh, yeah, so they're similar to like a tent that you can pack up and take around with you. So there's different types Travelers. of yurts. So this is like a yurt. Here's a yurt. Um, yeah. There are Can you the see those pictures? Yurts. Yeah, here's a yurt. Like and, next to the cow, yes, yeah. Yeah, this is an older one. I think you guys, some people have some similar type of uh, houses here even. But they're not this shape though, I think. And they, but they are made out of uh, similar things maybe. Yeah, I think so. Good. Good. All right, let's move on. Here, one of the, or sorry, the speaker said he had a real awakening when he traveled to Africa. What does an awakening mean? Uh, let me see, Zay, did you catch what that meant? What do you think? What does an awakening mean? Mm. He maybe was surprised or... Uh... It was an eye-opening experience. Perfect. Thank you, Zay. That's exactly what I was looking for. See if you could use that that vocab. That was excellent. So it sort of changed his perspective. It was an eye-opening experience. Good. Can any of you think of a time when you had an awakening? Uh, can I say? Sure, Mohammed. Oh, sorry. It's Who is it? Omar. Yeah. Uh, I had an, an uh, awakening when I started working. Uh huh. And uh, so, what changed? What what part of your perspective uh, I, changed? I, I had to be uh, responsible and self independent. Oh yeah. Like my, my parents stopped on giving me my my money. Uh huh. So I had responsibility for myself. Yeah. And you, and you had to make sure you were on time and you had to make sure that you did what the boss said to do exactly the way he wanted. Yeah, 
It's often an eye awakening experience, your first job. Good, Omar, that's excellent. Okay, then he, he saw that uh, these enormous trees and it just took my breath away. You guys should know what this one means because we learned breathtaking the other day. So if it takes your breath away, what does, what does that mean? It's like uh, you're unable uh, to express its beauty. Mesmerizing. Good, all those, those are all excellent answers. These houses are built in accordance with the habitat. Okay, and I think uh, it was either Heba or Yasmin that were talking about the way that they build the house was built in accordance with the habitat. So they use the environment around them. Yes. And number four, houses can be beautiful, but in most cultures they're built to be purely functional. What does that mean to be purely functional? Like, um, uh, no. fancy or something. Um, they only does the, the job. They only exactly. do the job. Exactly. They, so, they did not, uh, they did not uh, only want to the design. They only uh -huh. want to be perfect and uh, they have all what they need in the house. Mm -hmm. Not such as only the design and the beautiful thing from uh, the outside. Good. So it's just oh, it's something practical. that needs to be practical, useful. Good. What are three objects that are purely functional that you can think of? A car. Could be a type of car. Oh, okay. Okay, we got car. I don't what get else? the question. Okay, so More there are some. Me neither. Okay, so some things are meant to be. Um, extra beautiful, like we care about the way they look. And there are some things that we don't care about that. We just want to make sure that they are useful and practical. Now, someone said cars. Cars could be very beautiful, right? You could buy a car like, a, uh, I don't know, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini that's just like super beautiful. Or you could mm -hmm. just buy a Ford or Toyota that's just functional, where it does the job that you need it to do. Someone else mentioned mobile phones. You could buy a mobile phone that has all the extra stuff that is so cool and so awesome. Or you could just have a mobile phone that you can call people, text people, and maybe get on the internet, and that would be a fu purely functional mobile phone. Is there anything else that you think of that could be purely functional? Maybe I tools see. and screws uh, and stuff. Good. Air no conditioning units. Okay, air conditioning units, good. I think if we Engines. compare movies to books, books okay. may be really functional with no like design, beautiful things, uh, just words, sentences. All right, that's possible. Also, beds are usually just functional. Clothes. Okay, good. Beds, clothes, excellent. All those Boys, ideas are <laughs> good. All right, good. Um, now we're going to do a quick vocab lesson. This is just a little bit of a weird vocab lesson. Um, they're talking about adjectives that end in Y. There aren't a lot of adjectives that end in Y, but uh, I don't know why they decided to pick uh, particularly these words. Um, let's l look at these. Okay. Um, so... Here we have the word shady. Okay, so they took the word shade, word which shade. is a noun, and put Y on it, and it becomes an adjective shady. Okay, what does that mean to be shady? In hotter climates, people are forced to take refuge in shady dwellings. Not Maybe pro provide shade. Yeah, good. Shade. It's pretty up obvious. Here? Yeah. Like a Something that okay. has a dark side or a. Uh... It's uh, it has shades, uh, not not shades. Um, it's, it has uh, shaded from the sun, for example, something. Good. So, uh, in uh, Jordan, in the summertime, it's quite hot, right? But if you're in a shady place, usually it's pretty, pretty okay. Here we have oh, gloomy. But you, but you use the word shady in different like parts. Like you can describe someone acting weird, yeah, like he's acting shady. shady. Okay, that's a good point. Um, that's what I why thought. Do think, why do you think that we took the that word shady and started to, using it to describe people? Because um, it's covering something. It's keeping something mm -hmm. a like secret. How, someone who is operating in the dark. Good. I think 
Yes, I think Eminem started this word by calling uh, his uh, devil advocate um, Slim Shady. Uh huh. So, uh, um, any 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 song produced by Slim Shady is different than any uh, any that is produced by Eminem. Okay, uh, maybe I think he probably just adopted the word for his own use. I'm sure this word was around before he was. But you guys are right. Some when you start calling people shady, it's because they're the type of person who would only do things in the dark or not being wanting to be seen or wanting to cover their tracks or something like that. Good. So, so who it's is a the negative. Shady? Yeah, usually when you talk about people, it's a negative. Who is the shadiest person in our class? Do you think? Michael. Oh no, that's not me. Oof. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to uh, ask you again uh, why we can describe people shady. I didn't uh -huh. understand. So the, the main meaning of shady means that it uh, gives you shade from the sun. So that it's, but think of that, it's a little bit dark when you have shade from the sun. So when we start talking about people as shady, it's those types of people that, uh, do all of their business in the dark because maybe it's not the most ethical stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Now we have the word gloomy. The gloomy room suited her dejected mood. She stared at the dreary gray carpet and waited. So gloomy and dreary are almost the same. What do you think they mean? Sad or gloomy? Sad. Good. Sad and dark and depressed. Excellent. Yeah. And de dejected is depressed. also it means depressed, right? Okay, here we have roomy, roomy cottage, spacious, good views, airy kitchen with large windows, sleeps eight. So maybe this is an advertisement for some place to rent. So if they say roomy, what do you think that means, roomy? So one room like cottage. Some comedy. Not one room, it just means. I think cozy. Not, not cozy. It's spacious. Good. Light, so, maybe. Roomy, maybe. and it pro probably does have a lot of light because it's so spacious. Okay. So those are basically the same meaning, roomy and spacious. And airy is also very similar. There's a lot of air in there, so there's a lot of space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Native peoples would use animal skins to insulate the house from chilly weather in winter. So chilly is another way to say cold. cold. He saw the pokey interior, tiny and cramped. It was adorned by a cabinet repainted in gaudy colors, bright red, purple, and chilly yellow. Chilly is cold or hot? Chilly weather. is cold. Chilly is cold. How about cold? pokey? Pokey. Here we have pokey. It means tiny or small. Okay. So tiny means small, pokey means small. But uh, I think uh, pokey means uh, not only small, but it's kind of uh, small uh, in an uncomfortable way. Good. And also there's another meaning for pokey, which means very slow. So if uh, I'm walking along with my kids and they're walking too slow, I might say, stop being so pokey. So there's a couple meanings for this word. So sometimes it means small and uncomfortable. Sometimes it means slow. Tiny always means small. And gaudy, gaudy is these really bright colors that sort of don't fit with everything else. The opposite of gloomy, maybe? It could be. It's probably more it's like the gaudy opposite of... From the flashy? It's like flashy, yeah. And it does Did come gaudy probably... Come from the Spanish architect? Gaudi. I believe it did, yeah. And have you ever seen that Spanish architect's work? Yeah. So if we put that in here, you might see. So in Barcelona, there was a, an architect that, so he made these types of designs and his name was Gaudi. And so I think we took his name and turned it into an English word that means very flashy. I think they're pretty awesome. Yeah, I do too. Actually, yeah. I went and visited them. They were amazing. I only have some souvenirs from Gaudi stuff. Yeah, but he's an interesting architect. He's dead. <laughs> okay, sorry. He was an interesting architect. 
<laughs> so Michael, how do you pronounce his name again? Gaudi. Gaudi. Okay. Yeah, I think though in the English word that we use, I think we use it as Gaudi. 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 Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here are all those. I'm oh, sorry. Here are those words that they want you to know. Um, shady. Um, gloomy. Dreary. Oh, we, we skipped over gray. Now, when they say neutral and positive, what they mean is when we use it, do we use it in a positive, negative way? So shady normally is just normal, neutral word. When you talk about, uh, like if you go to the shady area away from the sun, but then there is that negative that we talked about already uh, when you talk about a person. Gloomy is usually a negative word. Dejected, which means depressed, is negative. Dreary is negative. Gray is neutral. Um, roomy is usually a positive. You want to live in a roomy house. Spacious means the same thing. Uh, you already know good. Airy is a positive word. Large, obviously. Native. What does that mean, native? You are native. Good. 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 Chili is Local. usually negative. Local. Good. Chili is usually negative because you don't want to be so cold. Pokey, tiny, cramped, they're usually negative. Gaudy, we use in a negative way now, even though the architecture was quite nice. And then, of course, the colors are neutral words. All right, so many adjectives end in Y. Some come from the root word, like dirty comes from dirt, noisy comes from noise. Others do not have a root word, like happy, there's no word hap. Pretty, there's no word prit. So um, if you don't know the meaning, you can often just guess from the context. Um, quickly, let's just listen to this British guy say these words. Make sure you have this button on, yeah. Yes. Unit three, recording three. One, dreary, city, really, two, gaudy, body, naughty, three, gloomy, footy, roomy, four, hockey, Jokey, pokey. Five, shady, ready, daily. Six, berry, airy, very. Okay, and you could have noticed when they are reading the three words together, there was one word that had a different sound than the other two. Um, but we're not going to concentrate on that. You guys, to be honest, have quite nice pronunciation. Uh, so if I notice a problem, I'll just uh, help you out if you say a word wrong. Let's go to page 150. 150. Is everybody still with me? Yes, 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 yes we are. Yep, we are. Okay, great. All right, we have a few more adjectives that you can learn. Okay, it's a vast, overpopulated metropolis. Okay, it's a quaint, secluded village far from any big cities. It's a scenic town with awe inspiring mountain views. It's a sprawling ramshackle slum. A slum is a uh, poor part of town usually where they don't have very nice buildings. So I want you to use the clues in these sentences to see if you can guess what these words, vast, quaint, secluded, scenic, uh, sprawling, ramshackle mean. Okay, let's try to, if you have your book, it'll be nice and easy. If you don't have your book, um, just try to pay attention, okay? How many of you, by the way, don't have a book with you? 
Um, which page, Mr. Mark? Me. Right on top. So like three of you? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so what I want you to do is pay attention, OK? So that you can listen to see which words mean extremely large or extremely impressive. OK. Hey. So I want everyone to try for about two minutes to match it yourself. These words. Mr. Michael, which page? One five zero. I have finished answering them, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Rod. We'll give everyone Thank 30 you. more seconds. Great. About 30 more seconds, we'll start. Okay, which word means extremely large? B. Vast. Is it vast? Vast. 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 Yeah. That's okay, vast. So now, why in English do we have all these words that mean the same thing? So extremely large and vast basically means the same thing. So why don't we just say extremely large all the time? I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Maybe then we won't have anything to learn in English advanced. <laughs> Good point, Ali. <laughs> so, um, I, think, I think most languages have that. I yeah, think that uh, every adjective is used with different uh, subjects or uh, nouns. Good. So, fast is with uh, cities or places, maybe. Excellent. So, it depends on the I context you're using. People use different languages. Mr. Michael? Say again, Tala. Um, what? what can I say? Hold on, Tala, you said something. Yeah, I said maybe different people from different areas around America and Britain use different ways to like express themselves. It's possible. Good, Hamza. I think that, uh, for example, we had the wo the word uh, large, then we had uh, vast, and uh, then we went. When we wanted to describe vast, we used both extremely and large, so it's extremely large. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think um, uh, po poets, uh, uh, poets or uh, uh, people who write, or s I don't know, they they came up with the, those words in order to fit their rhymes, or uh, I don't know. It's possible. Good. Um... Basically, it comes down to that we have uh, a few different levels of language. OK, we have the words that are common to everybody, and then we have the words that are really only known to the more educated people. 
And so one of the ways that we distinguish between someone who is a little bit more common and more educated is their language. Um, just like you can be rich with money, you can be rich with language. You can own more words. So that's one part of it. Now, English is a language that borrowed words from all over the world, okay? So we, we take them and uh, make them fit into what we want. Um, it comes from Latin, from Greek, a lot of them from French. Uh, we have a lot of words even from Arabic. Um, and so then we kind of combine them together. And so because of all that combination, it sort of created a, a huge amount of words. And now the point I want you to take from it, though, is we can use these words now to be very precise or exact with what we want to express. So instead of saying extremely large, which isn't very precise, we can use vast. And that mean, that automatically puts a very exact meaning onto the sentence. So once you start learning these words, you will be able to express your exact idea instead of just more general ideas. And uh, that's the stage that you guys are at now, is going from expressing general ideas to this exact expression. Okay? Um, how about this next one? B, extremely impressive in a way that makes you feel great respect. Scenic? No. Awe inspiring. Oh, inspiring. Awe inspiring. Good. Awe inspiring. So, awe, you know the word awesome. Okay. So, we also know the word awful. Okay. So, awful originally was a positive word, and over time it changed into a negative word. I'm not sure why, but it's full of awe. And awe is like something that's so amazing that just gives you all this, you feel so res respectful towards it. So, Awe inspiring goes here with B. And the next one, surrounded by views of beautiful countryside. Scenic. 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 Very Scenic. good. Scenic. Spreading over a wide area in an untidy or unattractive way. Uh, sprawling, I guess. Sprawling. Good. Now, um, usually towns, they start off very, or cities, they start off very um, dense and sort of close together and then as it grows it starts to sprawl would you describe uh, amman as a sprawling city yeah some some parts of it yes yeah so downtown yeah, is very so close together yeah, and, right? and then after you get more towards um the outer edges of the town it starts to become more sprawling okay how about this morning, uh, Sprawling is, is spreading over a wide area. And sometimes it's used in a negative way to say this kind of ugly. OK. OK, how about E? Unusual and attractive, especially in an old fashioned way. Quaint. 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 Good, quaint right here. Quaint. It's a not quaint, scenic. not scenic. No, okay, scenic okay, sorry, goes, sorry, yeah, yeah. Got it? What's the difference of quaint? Quaint means that it's uh, unusual and attractive, so it's it's more positive, but it adds in this meaning of being also old-fashioned, okay? So if you went to, say, um, for in Jordan, you might think of if you go to visit the Bedouin towns, you might say they're very quaint, okay? They're nice and attractive, you like it, but it's a little bit old-fashioned. So it's sense? an antonym for modern. Thank you. It is um it is opposite of modern, um, but uh, modern is is pretty neutral, it's just more like new. Whereas quaint is is quite positive when you talk about old stuff because you could have old stuff that's just bad, but if it if, right. you, if you say quaint, then it adds this positive note to it. Yeah. Okay. How about in bad condition and in need of repair? Ramshackle. Ramshackle, Ramshackle good. Ramshackle means it's uh, really in bad condition. Very private and quiet. Secluded. Secluded. Secluded, good. Secluded. And um, there Mr. Are Michael, many may I ask, what's yes, the meaning right. of slum? Slum is the part of town usually where 
it's very filled with very poor people and um, usually it's not very attractive. It's not well kept by the government. So that would be a slum. Do you have any slums in Jordan? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe yes, we do. some people say like Baga is maybe. I think downtown also has a lot of this. OK, yeah, so like in New York City, they have some areas that you might call slums where it's sort of run down and uh, the government doesn't take care of everything and uh, usually ends, ends up being the poor people that live there. Like okay, in Outcast, last... Michael? Like the area has been an outcast? Yeah, it's like the area has become an outcast, yeah. So I'm sure you see pictures even sure. like in other big cities, like uh, maybe uh, Mumbai or something, you might see a slum or uh, maybe a Los Angeles would have some slums, something like that. Brazil too. Yeah, good. Yeah, they have a special word for it, I think, uh, favela or something for that. Good. And then last one, there are too many people in a place. Overpopulated. 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 Good. All right. So lots of words to learn here. So take, make sure you get these in your book if you need them. And then start using them when you write about places. Okay. You ready to move on? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to page 132. 132. The grammar today is quite easy. It's mostly revision. You guys have been learning this forever. So. Page what? 132. 132. So relative clauses. OK, the big thing that you need to learn here is the difference between a defining clause and a non-defining clause. Some grammar teachers will call this an essential clause and a non-essential clause. Basically, that means if the relative clause, which starts usually with who or which or uh, where or that, if it so, is. Can you yes. repeat? Yes. It's Good. Lag. Yeah, sometimes I cut out. So relative clauses are those clauses that start with who or which or that or where or when. And there's a difference between a defining relative clause and a non-defining relative clause. Some English teachers will call this an essential clause, and this is non-essential. Now, essential means that it is important or needed. That's what essential means. So when we have these relative clauses, if they are needed for the meaning of the sentence, we call them defining clauses. And when they're needed for the meaning of the sentence, we do not use commas. But if they're non-defining, that's really just extra. They're giving you extra information. And when they're using the clauses to give extra information, we put comma before and after. So let's look at these two sentences. My uncle who lives in New York is coming to Oxford. OK, so we have this as a non-essential clause or non-defining because they put commas here. That means the fact that he lives in New York is just extra information. So in sentence one, who lives in New York? Uh, gives extra non-essential information about the uncle. Now here, part two, my uncle who lives in New York is coming to Oxford. Now this information becomes very important to the fact that it's describing uncle. Why and what is that is important and the, not important and the another or the second sentence? It's Im, it's important. How and did what you it know? Does what it does is it changes the meaning of the sentence a little bit. In sentence two, since it's important, it means a little bit different. That would mean that the speaker probably has more than one uncle. And so he is defining for us or identifying for us 
which uncle he's talking about. So maybe he has an uncle that lives in Los Angeles and an uncle that lives in um, Chicago. And so this is important now who lives in New York because now we know which uncle he's talking about. Whereas up here, it's not important. We don't really care about which uncle it is. It's just interesting that he lives in New York. You see this very, very slight difference between the meanings of these two sentences. Uh, okay. okay. It's, very, it's very subtle and very uh, slight, but as you become more advanced, you'll be able to take advantage of those details. So, um, and sometimes when we have a defining relative clause, we can leave off the pronoun that or which or who. So I could say, I've eaten the cake which I made yesterday. Or I could say, I've eaten the cake I made yesterday. We could both ways are correct, with or without the pronoun. So you can say it two ways here. Now in a non-defining clause, we're just talking about extra. So that project, which I started years ago, still isn't finished. The important part of the sentence is that it's not finished now, but he added on some extra that he started it a long time ago. Okay, relative pronouns, you know, we use who for people, which for things or groups of people, where for places, whose for possessions, so it belongs to that person, and that we can use for any of the pronouns, except you can, there's no way you can use that to replace whose. That's the only one that's impossible to replace with that. Um, there are some relative pronouns that we use after these phrases, some of, all of, a few of, none of. So just like you could say some of them, we can say some of whom. So here we have, she has four sisters, none of whom are married. And that's basically saying none of them, none of the sisters are married. And then there are a lot of phrases that use these relative clauses and relative uh, pronouns. So the company ran out of money, at which point I quit my job. So you just have to remember this phrase, at which point. Basically, it means then. He may work late, in which case I'll come home first. And that basically just, when you say in which case, it's basically saying if that happens. We watch the final, the result of which was never in doubt. Okay, and that's just a normal phrase, result of which. And then finally, when you have to do these prepositional, or sorry, these relative pronouns and you have a preposition with them, there used to be a rule a long time ago that you could not end an English sentence with a preposition, but that rule is changed. It's okay now to use a preposition at the end. So it's okay to say, he completed the book which he'd been working on. A long time ago, they would have made you say, he completed the book on which he had been working. But now this is perfectly normal to say in any situation. So don't really worry too much about this. It's okay to do either formal or informal. Okay, that's a lot of information. Anything new here that you don't understand? No. Teacher, I have a question about yes. uh, the two sentences, the sentences of uh, my uncle who lives in New York. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in uh, the way we spoke them like no not uh, not really you're gonna say i'm the same my uncle who lives in new york is coming to oxford my uncle who lives in new york is coming to oxford you might pause just a little bit when the commas are there but it's it's mm -hmm. gonna be so so small no one will really notice all right any other questions Nope. Okay. So really, I mean, this might be slightly new to you, but these phrases you can learn. Um, I think all the rest is pretty much revision. Um, I'm trying to decide if I want you to do any practice. Who feels like you need practice for this? 
for me. Tala? We can do it together. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, let's say if you are, if you have a book, okay? If you have a book, I want you to do part B. If you don't have a book, I want you to do part A because I'll just leave it on the screen for you. Okay, so if you don't have a book, you do part A. If you do have a book at home, do part B. And I'm going to uh, go to the bathroom for a second while you guys are working, and I'll be right back. ايش نعمل بالظبط؟ نحلهم إذا معك الكتاب سوي فيه، إذا ما معك سوي إيه، تعال نحل فيه كلنا مع بعض. المشكلة أنا ما معي كتاب وبي مو مبين أصلاً. ما هو إذا ما معك سوي إيه؟ اللي ما معه كتاب يحل إيه؟ سوي إيه؟ آه أوكي أوكي، ثانك يو. مين حل ثلاثة؟ أي صفحة السؤال بس سمحتي؟ أي صفحة؟ 133 133 أنا فرع أي أو بي ممكن ثلاث ذاتس ذا أو لا ذاتس ذا ومن هوم هوم ستيد Okay, I'm back. Are you guys ready? Could you give us two, uh, a couple of minutes? Sure, a couple more minutes.
Okay, let's go ahead and finish this off here. So, who did part A? Because they don't have a book. You can start and we'll uh, check how you did. So, number two. Just start reading at number one and keep going and I'll stop you. Who wants to start here in my early 20s? I can do it. Great. Is that you, Laith? Yes. Go ahead, Laith. In my early 20s, when I was a student, I used to hang out in a few places, none of which were exactly posh. Good. Keep going. Oh, there was only CD, uh, CD dive called uh, Schubert. Uh-huh. I Good. actually didn't know the third one. I think he's an acquaintance of mine. Uh -huh. Can we say he's an, he's an acquaintance Can of mine name? whose name I've forgotten? Good. And Played we're going to say piano. Schubert's is okay. a place. So Schubert's is a place. It's called a CD dive. So here's another adjective with a Y. CD means it's, it's sort of like shady in that negative sense where it's uh, a place where it's not very good people will be there. And a dive is a type of restaurant or bar that is uh, not so beautiful, we might say. So it's called Schubert's. So here we're going to say where. There was one CD dive called Schubert's where an acquaintance of mine. Who's whose name? Whose who name I've forgotten. Good. Played the piano. Okay, who wants to keep going? What is three, sorry? Three is where? Can I? Yes, Hamza. Okay. Um, but my favorite hunt in which I uh, I remember, right? In which I remember, let's see. Of which, in which, that's a tricky one. I don't know. I would probably say where I remember everything. So maybe at which? About which? Okay. About. About which I remember everything included, including the decor. So when they say about which, what they're really saying is, I remember everything about this favorite place. Okay, and included a Matisse poster. Anybody get sick? Where? Where edges were peeling off the wall. That could be good. I would say who's. It? Yep, you could also say who's. Excellent. Okay, how about seven? The table. Which I? Can I do it? In which I regularly sat. Now we we can say which if we say at which because we say I where? sat at at the table or you can say where good so you could mm -hmm. say the table at which I regularly sat or the table where I regularly sat faced a window from from which, from which you could see the street or from where you could see the street both of them again. Mm -hmm. I must have gone to Johnny B's every day until I graduated. By which? Can we see then? No, we would say by which. Did they put it in here? It doesn't look like they did. I would say by which time or by which point? By which point? I was virtually living there. And that's just a phrase that we use all the time. They can use at which point or by which point. Basically, when you say that, it does mean when or then. Most of the dissertation, a dissertation is like a long report that you have to do. Most of the dissertation. Of which? Of which? All right, now let's look, let's back up here and go. We would say, I was working something dissertation. Would you say of the dissertation or I was working on, on which? On, exactly. So since we would say I was working on the dissertation, 
we would use on which in this case. On which I was working was conceived. Conceived means thought of for the first time and Johnny B's. I went back last year and saw the same people. None of which people. Whom? Whom? Good. None of whom had changed except for a few gray hairs. All right. I'm going to read this to you again, and you can put the answers into your book to study later. In my early 20s, when I was a student, I used to hang out in a few places, none of which were exactly posh. Posh means uh, very... Um, very English. London. Like. Yeah, elite. Very elite. Good. I like that. Elite. There was one CD dive called Schubert's where an acquaintance of mine, whose name I've forgotten, played the piano. But my favorite haunt, and a haunt is a place that you go to a lot, sort of like a ghost haunts a house because the ghost is there a lot. My favorite haunt, about which I remember everything, including the decor, decor is decoration, a Matisse poster whose edges were peeling off the wall, was Johnny B's Cafe. The table where I regularly sat faced a window from which you could see the street. I must have gone to Johnny B's every day until I graduated, by which time I was virtually living there. Most of the dissertation on which I was working was conceived in Johnny B's. I went back last year and saw the same people, none of whom had changed except for a few gray hairs. Okay, so when he was telling this story about the place, so he went a lot when he was... Uh, in college, he used a lot of these relative clauses. All right, last thing, and then I'll let you go. Uh, and then you guys can ask me any questions about the assignments if you want. All right, let's do this real quick. Um, there were lots of children there, and all of them sang really well. There were lots of children there. All of whom? You probably don't need the of. You could just say who. Oh, sorry. Maybe you do. Who of who sang who? really well. Who? Who sang really well? I would say some of whom or all of whom. I would all something like that. All of whom sang really well. Let's see here. Let's just, since we're running out of time, let's go ahead and give you the answers here. Who wants to read number sure. two for us? When the I alarm can. went off, the lesson ended. Good. Whoever said I can, go ahead. Um. We stayed in the women's house. That's the women whose house we stayed in. Good. So we did number three. And notice because they had the possessive here, the house belongs to the woman. That's why they used whose here, because whose is the possessive form of the pronouns. Good. Number four. Who wants to read it? I can. I can read it. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, go ahead Safe. Safe. No, me, Safe. Safe, go ahead. Claire is the person I learned the most from. The person from whom I learned from. Sorry, from whom I learned the most is Claire. Good. And so see how they use from in the original sentence? And so that's why they use from here in the change sentence. And then whom is... Okay. The person, yes. Can we say uh, the person whom I learned from the most? Yes, you can put the most at the end. Mm -hmm. Good. Five? May I? I'll read it. Uh, let's do Rod and Tala. You can do number six. Okay. If you get a scholarship, you won't need to pay. You may get a scholarship, in which case you won't need to pay. Good, and that's a nice phrase to use in which case. In which case basically means uh, if this happens. Okay, and Tala? Um, there are two photocopiers in the office, which are both out of order. There are two photoco photocopiers in the office, both of which are out of order. Good. All right, so it's a little tricky still, uh, but I think you guys will get it. Um, do you have any questions about this? Um, what does by which time mean? Um, say it again, Yasmin. By which time? What does it mean? By which time means, um, that was over here, right? Yes, yeah. number nine. Uh, number nine. Every day, by which time? So, 
By which time means um, by the time this happened before. So he graduated, right? So by the time he graduated, he was virtually living there. It means by the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the which refers back to graduated. So when you say by which time, they mean by the time this happened. Yes, okay. Good. Any other questions? Uh, and B, number four. Uh huh. Uh, can we put from at the end the person whom I learned the most from is yes. clear? Yes, you can. Okay. Ma, can I ask you a question? Yes. Can I say at the A9? Mm -hmm. uh, by which point? Yes. By which point? It's, okay. it's both correct. By which time? By which point? And That's it's right. the same meaning. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Mr. Michael, I have a question about uh, A5, uh, hunt. What's the meaning of hunt here? A5, sorry. Oh, haunt, yeah. So the literal meaning of haunt is when you think of a spirit or a ghost that is in a place, this, the ghost haunts that place. It means it stays there and um, scares everyone. But we took that word and to mean uh, the place that you always like to go. So it's sort of a... We took the original meaning and changed it to fit a little bit different meaning. So if you call a place a haunt, that means it's a place that you're it's my always favorite going place. To. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't have any more questions, you're free to leave the class. If you have any questions about the assignment, you can stay and ask me anything you want. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Don't forget that you have an assignment due tonight. Uh, please try to finish it and submit it by midnight. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Have a good, good job. Weekend. Bye, Mr. Michael. Bye, Mr. Michael. Great. Yes. Um, I have a question. Uh, how can I make sure if uh, I, I submitted to you the assignment? Uh, I can check it right now if you'd like. How, which way did uh, you I submit it, Omar? I did not submit it yet, uh, okay. but uh, can you like confirm it with uh, an email saying that uh, you have received it or? Uh, have you ever submitted with uh, e-learning before, Omar? No, I haven't. Okay, so when you submit it, it will, um, it should give you a confirmation that it is submitted on the e-learning site. Are yeah, you able so... to log it? Are you able oh, to yes, log I in? Am. To learn? Yes, okay. there are no problems with it. Okay, so okay. give it a shot. And uh, for you, Omar, if you want, I can uh, confirm this week and then I get it. Can okay. we submit so the email? Yes, mean. I'd prefer that you, I would prefer that you submit uh, everything by e-learning, except if you want to send me the results of your personality test by email, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Michael, um, I don't know how to attach a file on e-learning. Actually, can you show me? Sure. Sure. So let me take you. And can I send it by email and e-learning to to make sure that it's sub submitted? Yeah, that's okay. You can send it two ways. Uh, but if it's not uh, as a correct way in uh, e-learning, you will be. Okay with the email, yeah? But I will Yeah, yeah, I'll be okay. Just go ahead and try and see what you can do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So can you guys see my screen now? I'm in yeah, your yeah. class. Yes. Okay. So when you go to unit one, assignment, um, there's, mine's gonna be different than yours because I have the teacher version. So yeah. I can see who submitted it, but there you should have an option where you can say submit and then it should give you the option where you can um, attach a file, attach a file. Yeah. And okay. and then you can just pull the file off of your your computer. 
So here I, you can see, this is what I see when I look at it. But it's way different than what you have, I'm sure. So I have a submission from Muhammad and a submission from Rod, no, no, not Rod, uh, Taki and Walid. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Michael. Mm -hmm. Mr. Good luck. Michael. I mean, yes. Uh, I have a question. It, it might sound stupid, but I just want to make sure that I'm doing uh, the correct job. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Omar. Um, you, you said that we have to choose 20 words first mm -hmm. and 15 sentences. Mm -hmm. Right. So can we can we write the, the 15 sentences in the analytical uh, uh, paragraph or is it like separated? I would prefer it would probably be easier just to do them separate. So um yeah you could just do so for example if one of your words was uh i don't know uh, what was one of the words you didn't know on there omar do you remember uh, vibrant vibrant okay so vibrant did you find out what vibrant means uh, yes it's like something that moves uh uh, I think what I understood is that it moves quickly, but like uh, I, I don't know how to explain. But no, it's kind. Of, you're kind of right. It's something that is full of energy and life. So you might say, um, after the lockdown in Amman, the cities were vibrant, and that just means there's a lot of people there and a lot of energy. Like uh, after the lockdown finished, you might say that city was vibrant or and so you could just use it like that just so i can see that you understand how to use that word okay thank you mr michael mm -hmm. can i ask you a question please of course when you say for us uh, 100 words it must mm -hmm. be 100 words or can i no. make it a little bit yeah you can make it around 100 words that's just a uh, uh estimation of how much it can be a little bit more a little bit less okay thank you thank mm -hmm. you mr michael you're welcome good luck have a nice day. you can stay sanitized <laughs> you too all right bye-bye <laughs>